I'm impressed. Um, I'm just going to say that right now. I'm, I'm really, really impressed with this latest core set and the spoilers we're seeing. And, um, you know, we're not even halfway through all the spoilers. There's still um, a lot of mythics to go and rares, you know, on commons, on commons, all that. A lot of very um, powerful cards we are seeing so far. And, uh, yeah, this seems to be um, a set like uh, no other core that we've seen in uh, recent history. So, um, awesome. If you compare it to, you know, last year's core set or the one before that, this one just hits a home run, you know. And those ones might be on, you know, third base or second, you know. But this one is really just kicking butt. The reprints, the power level, everything's just, just there. So, let's get into some stuff. Uh, first, I wanted to clear some things up. I noticed a lot of confusion in the comment section. Um... What, what sets are in standard now? That's not really confusing. What is confusing to people is rotation. I hope this clears it up for everyone out there because I threw some cards on the screen um, the other day for cats, you know, that are still going to be legal or dogs or hounds or whatever. And people are like, oh, too bad it's going to rotate out. And you got a bunch of, like, upvotes. And I'm like, no, it's not, actually. No, it's not. But I wanted to address that right now. And uh, it's easy to – a lot. this happens, it seems, around every rotation time. You know, people get confused. It's nothing's rotating on a standard until Zendikar Rising. That's when rotation starts, okay? So we'll lose the last four sets. They'll drop off, you know. Um, uh, it just goes to show you. So, yeah, there will be stuff rotating out, but not until Zendikar Rising. It's We're not rotating with Core Set 2021. Sets always rotate in the fall, not in the summer. This is a summer, you know, set. Uh, so there you have it. I hope that clears up some things for everyone. So let's get into the spoilers today. We got these back. <sighs> cool, but I think underwhelming. You know, I think we wanted um, some some bigger uh, land cards, but we'll get to one of those. I'm in, uh, uh, look. This is cool. The whole scry one thing is legit, um, but the power the power level of this. I mean, you just kind of get a little disappointed. It always comes in tapped, um, no matter what, unless you have out like uh, what. Blood Sun or whatever, um, that um, it negates any kind of land ability other than the mana, you know, uh, it, any text on the card. So if it enter tapped, you know, it wouldn't enter tapped, stuff like that. But that's not even in standard. That would have, you have to go to historic. Speaking of which, I'm going to make a deck. Thousand Year Storm. I'm going to be uh, doing something with Thousand Year Storm here pretty soon. So you guys have asked for that for a long time. So stick around for that. It's either going to be today or tomorrow. Here we go. Pursued Whale is a 7-drop. This is a big boy, you know, probably for limited, for sure, but it's got a neat ability on it. When Pursued Whale enters the battlefield, each opponent creates a 1-1 red pirate creature token. Notice it's each opponent. So, yeah, your commander, your brawl, you know, that people would like that. Um, this creature can't block, and on that card text, it would say, Creatures you control attack each combat if able. So as long as that token, that 1-1 one, one red pirate creature token, um, is in an opponent's, uh, bat or on an opponent's battlefield, yeah, they have to swing in uh, with their creatures every time, and uh, that creature can't block. So they have to figure a way to get rid of it, you know. Um, the fact that it can't block is pretty cool, because then if you're attacking them, they can't just get rid of that pirate token. Oh, it's block. Okay, now it's dead. Whoop do you know. So that's kind of cool. And then spells your opponent's cast that target... Uh, Pursued Whale cost three more to cast. That gives it a bit of protection for sure. It's an 8-8. Eight, eight. Seven drop, though. Um, I'm not sure how much play this is going to see in standard. Probably not a lot, but as far as, like, limited, you know, you're sealed and all that stuff, drafting, you will see this card uh, getting a lot of play. Very, very cool, um, to say the least. I, I like it. That's like Moby D right there, man. If there ever was a Moby D, that's the Moby D right there. Uh, Temple of Silence, that's right. Um, more of these um, these scry these scry lands, I, I like them. I mean, they fit in, in in decks, you know, in certain situations, especially like if in your combo decks or whatnot. You'd you know you'd probably want to run some kind of scry lands, you know, or just you know it just helps filter through the garbage, I guess. Temple of Mystery. They kept the art though, that I found kind of kind of different or not different. It's the same. Uh, I found that kind of bland, I guess. Temple of Epiphany. They really should have changed up the art. I think every time they do a new land, unless it's like some very impressive land from old school times, you know, um, keep uh, keeping the art is kind of just, eh, it's, it's all right, though. Uh, here is a new land card. Bada bang, new art on this mountain. Again, I like a lot what Wizards is doing with the lands. They're making it fresh. They're making it hip, 
okay, hipsters of the coast, there you go. They're making it very hip, um, and I, I like the look of it. I think it appeals to a younger generation, and also uh, it's getting a facelift, and I think that's pretty cool. So hats off again for the Lance. There you go. Bam! Heroic intervention. Holy smother and tithe. This is a powerhouse, and I think this card was upwards to about 15 bucks. Now it got the reprint. You expect it to drop to like two, three dollars, you know, roughly. Uh, but instant permanence you control, gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn for just two. It sees a lot of commander play as well. It sees play uh, outside of commander and your pioneer, you know, all that stuff. Uh, probably a little bit of modern as well. It is a powerful card. Permanence you control, gain hexproof and indestructible. So they cannot be destroyed. And they cannot be targeted. That is, uh, that's a that's a bomb right there, man. Uh, I like I, I like it a lot. Power in green. I'm starting to see a lot of power in green and in white. Um, and we're gonna get to some more powerful white cards soon for sure. But I'm I'm impressed. I'm very very impressed. I'm glad that card got a reprint. Here's Stormwing's presence now again. A lot of these cards are in a different language, so I just run it through translation, and then I make my own version of it. Okay, that's why it looks so sloppy. Um, or not sloppy, but just, you know, kind of basic. Like, that, that's not a real card. People are like, that's a fake. Well, I, I, I made that, you know. I, I know, it's my latest creation. Uh, Stormwing's Presence is a five-drop creature elemental. The spell costs three less to cast if you have cast an instant or sorcery this turn. Hello, like, opt or something, you know. Um, so then, well, I guess it wouldn't be too big of a deal. You know, you know, well, yeah, it would be kind of a big deal. Yeah, get it on the battlefield for cheap. That's not bad. Cool thing, it has flying and it has prowess. If only it had haste. I know, I always say if only it had haste, but really, um, very cool card. And then when Storming the Presence enters the battlefield, you also get a scry too. So there's a lot of abilities on this one card. I think this uh, has potential to see uh, a heck ton of play. I mean, the fact that you can play it for ultimately like three when all is said and done, you know, because you still have to pay at least one mana to cast some instant or sorcery spell. Paying just three for flying and prowess, three, three. That's legit. Prowess, um, it gets plus one, plus one for every instant and sorcery spell you cast this turn. That's what prowess does. So not bad. I think it's a good card. Um, not sure about competitive play because then well, I, I actually it could be. It could be. You never know. Three, three, flyer. Paying only three to get it out. Not bad. Not bad with built-in abilities as well, you know. I think it's cool. Um, then we have Sal <laughs> Sour. We have Soul Seer. Three drops. Soul Seer deals five damage to target creature. Planeswalker that permanent loses indestructible until end of turn. Another cool card. Um, Red, I don't think I've seen something like this in some time, but the permanent loses indestructible until end of turn. So, yeah. So much for, uh, yeah. But you know what? One thing you couldn't do. Um, with this card, it doesn't lose hexproof. So as far as heroic intervention would go, you know that this would not work with that. You know, like it would be like, nope, sorry, you you still can't kill it, loser. You know, and that's just how the cookie crumbles. But not that everyone's going to have a heroic intervention in their hand or something. But uh, losing indestructible, that's massive, man. If if especially with all the ways you can give indestructible um, right now in uh, in standard especially with the set coming. That's a pretty cool card. Um, and just to be like, nah, dude, oh, you just paid an extra one or two or you sacrificed your dog or whatever the case may be to give it indestructible. Well, it's still dead. We'll, we'll see you later. So I do like that. Um, it's only Planeswalker or Creature, though. Would have been neat if it said Player, but then no. I mean, because then the indestructible wouldn't go with that as well. Uh, good card. I like it. It's a good card. Hot dogs. Um, expect to see more of these over the next couple years. Fabled Passage, as you guys know. Evolving Wilds, just an amazing card. However, Fabled Passage came along and scooted it out the way, you know? And um, Fabled Passage is a very powerful card. You get a sacrifice, Fabled Passage, search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, tap and shuffle your library. However, if you control four or more lands, that land enters untapped, you know, and that's a big deal. It's like an evolving wild on steroids, um, more words or less. So the number of times they printed evolving wilds has to be like 25, 30. I'll address it for the first time. It's a meme on the channel. I don't know how many times I've seen people in the comments just go, this guy's stupid. Oh, my God. Evolving Wilds. This is like the 30th time it's been printed. Oh, what are you, new? Oh, my God. I'm unsubscribing. And I'm like, I don't care. Um, it's a joke on the channel, uh, the Evolving Wilds, you know, thing. 
Um, I'm well aware it's been printed into oblivion. That's kind of the joke. You know, every time I see the card, I'm impressed by it. And I'm like, whoa, oh my God, evolving. Whoa, what does it do? And I read it, you know, and, and I give off a very um, believable speech, you know, and I say it, you, you can't tell I'm, I'm, I'm joshing you, you know, you, you just, you just, you, you buy it, you know, because especially if you're new to the channel, you're like, this guy's an idiot. But I mean, that's part of the, it's part of the appeal of the channel. You know, we make some, some very, uh, outrageous jokes at time. They're just hard to swallow. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, good times. So fabled passage, getting a reprint, um, just printed, but two sets ago, three sets ago, I expect to see more fabled passage reprints. So I hope you guys have not dove in and invested too much in fabled passage. I mean, you don't want to invest in anything, um, other than reserve list cards and magic, in my opinion, unless you're one of those guys that it's really quick to flip, you know, a card, um, then that's, that's understandable, you know, buy a hundred copies of something and then the card spikes. Well, you better dump it quick when it spikes, you know, if it's not on the reserve list, because otherwise you're going to be eating bullets like this fabled passage right here, getting a reprint. Expect a lot more to come. Increase vitality, three drop, pretty cool. Um, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control, then double the number of plus one, plus one counters on that creature. Sounds a little familiar, similar, but it would go nice with something silly like this. The Hydra's Growth. I know that's six mana to get this going, and then you have to have a creature on top of it with plus one, plus one counters already on it. But the craziness, I'm just going to make a shenaniganical deck, you know, shenaniganical. Look it up. It's in Joy Moss Dictionary. But um, using Hydra's Growth and Increased Vitality, you know, with one creature, that can be a lot of fun. And creatures that you'd want to target with something like that would probably be like a Yorvo because it enters with four plus one, plus one counters. Give that thing trample. We'll see you later, Alligator. Another target would be something like Voracious Hydra, if you, especially if you could protect this thing now that Heroic Intervention is out. Man, there's going to be a lot of fun. You give, um, you know, use, Voracious Hydra seems to get eaten up right away, you know. It'll get removed. There's a lot of removal out there. But now that Heroic Intervention's out there, man, you could pump and dump and get crazy and uh, just, boosh, you know, just run over your opponent, um, you know, by putting those uh, cards on a Voracious Hydra and then protecting it. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. It looks fun. You guys know monocolored green is one of my favorite to run just because of all the creatures, you know. Then we have Pride Malkin. Three drop cat. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Each creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it has trample. For a while. In standard, I've been trying to get Zagana Utopian Speaker to work, you know, and um, it just, it does, you know, but it's never a competitive kind of deck or whatnot. Uh, what it does, very similar, when it enters the battlefield, if you control another creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it, draw a card, okay? So that's nice. And then it has an adapt for six. You can adapt it. Creature has no plus one, plus one counters on it. You put plus one, plus one counters on it. But each creature control with a plus one, plus one counter on it has trample. Same text in this card. This one is three to cast. Better, bigger perks off of this one. I don't know that this is going to become something, but it could for just three. I mean, look, now you just gave your Yorvo over here trample, you know, just by paying the three. Boom. Now it has that for good. It's only a two, one though. Downside. I would have loved to have seen this be a two drop because, man, the, the decks you could make then with this whole plus one, plus one counter, given uh, our, all your creatures with plus one, plus one counters on them have trample, I think there would have been a lot more ways to go about it, and, and, and it could have been a competitive kind of deck. At three, though, I don't know because I've seen how it worked with Zagana at four, and there's a lot more perks here. We'll have to see, but uh, I highly doubt it, you know, for competitive play. But you never know. You just play this one time, and then all your stupid dummies with plus one, plus one, now they all got trample. So it could be like a big boom when it hits the field, you know, when you swing in. We will see. Time will tell, man. But really, really neat. Uh, next, we have Dire Fleet Warbringer, another card, you know, that had to translate and all that. Uh, three drop creature, Orc Pirate. Pirates are back. That's kind of crazy. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may sacrifice another creature you control. If you do, Dire Fleet Warbringer gets plus two, plus two, and trample until end of turn. That's stupid. So I'm like Cauldron Familiar would like that, you know, with the cat oven, you know, with the oven build as well. I cannot wait, I'm, I'm serious, until the stupid cat and oven rotate out. But while it's in, you can expect to see some interaction, you know, in a sacrifice build and maybe door, a Dire Fleet Warbringer being up in there. Plus two, plus two, and trample until end of turn is pretty good. Now you got a 5-5 five, five on your hands running over your opponent, you know. 
And you can do that again and again when something stupid like Cauldron Familiar and the witches are the, the oven and all that. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's just one little idea there. And there you have it. Next up, we got a really powerhouse. A powerhouse for white. That's right. Um, gives you some card draw. Um, also, not even card draw, but in a different way. Uh, card advantage. Um, this is the card. A card with the words, remember? Um, they were talking about this. The word battlefield, the word cast, the word creature, the word converted mana cost, end of turn, exile, graveyard, and mana cost, all on one card. Here it is. It's Idol of Endurance, and it's similar to Loris of the Dream Den. Some differences, of course. When Idol of Endurance enters the battlefield, exile all creature cards with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard until Idol of Endurance leaves the battlefield. For two, tap it until end of turn. You may cast a creature spell from among the cards exile with Idol of Endurance without paying its mana cost. So if Loris was in your graveyard, you can now bring back Loris, although Loris wouldn't really interact well. These, these cards don't interact too great with each other, okay? Because once you got Loris in the graveyard, then you bring this out and exile it, you know? I guess you could play it again, but then your whole graveyard's exiled. When the cards are done being exiled, though, if, this, if Idol of Endurance leaves the battlefield, the exile effect, doesn't it go away? Yeah, they would go right back in the graveyard, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, that should be how it goes. Because there's no other exile zone. There's no other... If it's not exile or graveyard, there's no other area. Um, I do believe they did create one for memes. Like, in the out-of-the-game exile zone, like, it was something silly in one of those unsets. But this is a very interesting card. I think it's powerful. I really, really do. Uh, yeah, for just two, you can, you know, cast stuff that's three. That's not bad. And you can, uh, yeah, it's in your hand at all times. The problem is, you'd have to tap this. So you can only do it once a turn, similar to Loris over here. Uh, Loris is also only two or less from a graveyard, where this is three from that exile zone. That's another thing. Everything has to be already in the graveyard when this thing hits. You know, the cards you want to bring back have to, you know, be in the graveyard. So there you have it. It's not like every new card that goes in the graveyard goes into exile. It's not how the card works. So very interesting. And also, this is Grave Hate protection at its finest. You know, if you're up against a deck that's running Grave Hate, um, I mean, it might be too late by the time you even get this thing on, on the battlefield, but one thing to consider. Cool card. We'll see what it does. Volcanic Salvo is a big old 20, not 20, a big old 12 drop, but you can reduce the casting cost of it. The spell costs X less to cast, where X is a total power of creatures you control. That's cool. Volcanic Savo deals six damage to up to two creatures and or planeswalkers of your choice. Notice it doesn't say players. If this thing said player on it, I mean, it'd be busted, but it does not say player. Sorry. Sorry, Red. Sorry. But uh, I think, nonetheless, it could be a cool deck, especially to go with that elemental. You know, this could be a way to have some fun with that. Um, it, maybe a sideboard card. Uh, I don't know if you want to main board this. I mean, what if your opponent's not running any creatures? You know, then it's kind of crappy. What if they're not running any creatures or planeswalkers? What if they got an enchantment heavy deck? You know, who knows? But uh, interesting card nonetheless. Cool card. Then we have, um, yeah, that. You know, I'm going to try to say this. Y'all Rao Wanvuli Recluse. Sure. And Menjara. This is like a whole throwback to Mirage uh, in, in, my, in my thoughts here. But these two cards, uh, they, they go together pretty good. I think more so we're going to see the Recluse over here in Simic builds where you're draw heavy. But running it with the Diplomat is also a possibility, you know. Um, whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a 2-2 two, two green cat creature token, you know. So if you're up against a deck that, you know, is attacking you, well, that's going to work. These two synergize pretty well. You get the card draw. And also, um, for the 6 over here, until end of turn, creatures you control have base power and toughness. XX where X is the number of cards in your hand. So all those cards, you know, you're drawing from, uh, the interaction with these two is pretty cool. I like it. Um, it's a 1-2. It's only 2 to bring out. I think for only having a 2 converted mana cost, it's not bad. And uh, I would expect to see some decks built with this uh, this theme right here. But I think more so, you probably want to go with Simic Colors just because of the draw heaviness. Not bad. We shall see what it does. Um, yeah. And that's each turn. Did you notice that? Second card, each turn. So on your turn, if you draw a card, on their turn, you draw a card, that's, by the time it gets back to you, one round, one cycle round, you know, that's 
two creatures you just dropped. It's pretty good. And if you're in Commander or something, even crazier, you know, that'd be nuts. Um, all right, so then we have Arc Fiend's Vessel. It's a one drop with lifelink. This card's stupid. When Arc Fiend's Vessel enters the battlefield, if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, exile it. If you do, create a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token with flying. So as long as you can kill this thing off and you got something like Loris or the Dream Den, you can bada bing. There you go. Now you have a 5-5 five, five black demon creature token with flying. That simple. Just got to get this thing dead. Just get it dead, guys. Get it dead. That's a new. That's gonna be something new on the channel. Get it dead. You get it dead, Fred, and you're good to go, man. And uh, Loris can bring it back. Boom, five five, right there, right off bat. We also have Obsessive Stitcher. It's a three drop. Uh, tap it, draw a card, then discard a card. Up into mirror colors, and for four, I like this. You tap it, sacrifice Obsessive Stitcher, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It's all built into one. I don't think we've seen something like this before where you have a way you can draw a card, discard the card you you know you want to put into your graveyard so you can resurrect it with the resurrection spell or something. Well, this does that as well. You can discard, drop your creature, get rid of it. You draw your card, there's a the creature, boom, get rid of it. It's your 16-16 crazy freaking worm. You don't want to even play it. Well, now you pay four, boom. Now that now that 1616 Great Worm is on the battlefield. Sure, why not? Just some thoughts. I mean, it's just some silly shenanigans. I'll make decks around it. We'll have fun. Um, but yeah, there you have it. It's going to be a fun standard uh, for sure. Things are going to get shook up real fast. I like it. it um, I, I, I'm very excited about the standard without saying anything more about it. Um, what are your guys' thoughts? But please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. And uh, there are going to be more, more and more videos coming around. I think we're going to start doubling up on videos uh, daily um, pretty soon here. Possibly today. Skadoosh. <laughs>